Good morning. Welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 26th of August. And this quick look at the week ahead, beginning the 29th of August, with me, Michael Hewson. Um, having got off to a poor start to the week, US markets finished yesterday with a fairly decent rebound ahead of today's widely anticipated speech by Fed Chairman Jay Powell. Now, obviously, as I record this video, um, I won't know the contents of that speech. So, to a certain extent, I'm going to be guessing um, as to what he is likely to say. But I think there's been an awful lot of what I would call um, misunderstanding about what the Fed is likely to do over the course of the next 12 to 18 months. Um, I think sometimes it pays for central bankers to be deliberately ambiguous when it comes to talking about monetary policy and it allows them the flexibility to argue they've been misunderstood. However, there wasn't really much to misunderstand when Powell said at the last press conference that the Fed was um, where, you know, within the, within the confines of where they thought the neutral rate would be, i.e. between 2.25% to 2.5%. Um, I think certainly when you look at previous Fed chairmen, They've always, they've always employed this policy of constructive ambiguity to fairly good effect. You know, Alan Greenspan once famously was quoted as saying, I know you think you understand what you thought I said, but I'm not sure if you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. Now, if you can take the bones out of, yeah, out of that, you're a better person than me. So when Powell said that, the Fed funds rate was in the range of what they thought was neutral at between 2.25% and 2.5%. Was he being serious? It's a remark he was widely lambasted for. And since then, a series of Fed policymakers have pushed back hard on that narrative. However, that hasn't stopped the markets from taking the view that the, the Fed could well start cutting rates sometime next year. In the current environment, I think that is highly, highly unlikely. And today's speech by Powell could reset that narrative. Now, let's look at what markets have done this week. I've talked a lot in recent days and weeks about this move lower in equity markets and whether or not this is a bear market rally. Certainly on the basis of this chart, it still is. We've seen a little bit of a rebound in the last couple of days. But overall, what we've seen thus far hasn't really altered my view that we could well see further downside, but only as long as we hold below the 200 day moving average and the trend line from the highs this year. We found a bit of a base around about 4,075. And obviously that is the next key support level. And we are now starting to look a little bit oversold but the bias still remains very much towards the downside, even though we have moved higher over the course of the past few weeks. Much will depend, obviously, on what Powell says later today. More importantly, I think it's really about how we see US monetary policy going forward, because if you look at headline CPI for the US, yeah, it's dropped from uh, 9.1 to 8.5, but that's just one month. Recent economic data, has been ambiguous at best. Weekly jobless claims have started to fall back. We've got non-farm payrolls coming up um, next week. And obviously that's the big data item that markets will probably be obsessing about when it comes to whether we can expect to see a 75 basis point rate hike in September or 50. Maybe Powell's speech later today will give us clues about that as well. But certainly in the overall scheme of things, in terms of what markets have been doing, we still remain very much in a downtrend. And until such times as that trend line on the DAX breaks on the upside here and goes towards the 200 day moving average and the S&P 500 does the same thing. Whatever Powell says, um, we need to break the downtrend, the, the downside bias that we've been in since the beginning of the year. Everything else, to, from a technical standpoint, is just noise. So, what's the what's the what's the big what's the big question? An awful lot of people, an awful lot of Fed policymakers have been saying that they see the Fed funds rate by year end between three and a half and four percent. 
So that implies at least another 100 or 150 basis points between now and the end of the year. There are only three more Fed meetings due by year end, September the 21st, and there's one in November and one in December. So if you're going to deliver 150 basis points between now and the end of the year, then at least one of those needs to be 75 basis points. Why? Because Fed policymakers have said that they want to front load any rate hikes. The bigger question is, once the Fed funds rate is at near around 4%, how long does it stay there? And this is where the market has become disconnected from reality. It is unlikely that inflation will start to fall back fast enough for the Fed to even consider cutting rates in 2023. And this is possibly where the reset may come. At the moment, the markets are pricing in the prospect that we could see rate cuts next year. I don't believe that will happen. An awful lot of people don't believe that will happen, but the market for some reason thinks that it will. It could be a case of we may be turning the playbook on its head rather than being lower for longer, as has been the case over the course of the past 10 years in terms of interest rates. We could well be starting to pivot to higher for longer over the course of the next 12 to 18 months. And this is a message that I don't think the market has fully come to terms with. So I'll be interested to see whether or not that dynamic shifts. And I think an awful lot of that will depend on how the payrolls data that we, we get to see next week. We've also got the return of the ADP payrolls report after that payrolls report was suspended for the last couple of months while they refine or redefine the methodology. But ultimately, after the payrolls of last month, which came in at 528,000, blowing away even the most optimistic of expectations, expectations for August are for a gain of 300,000. The unemployment rate to stay unchanged at 3.5%, and for average hourly earnings to edge higher towards 5.3% from 5.2%. Labour participation, labour force participation, is still fairly low. You've got to sort of ask yourself at some point with the cost of living crisis whether this will start to go up because at the moment it's showing little sign of doing so. But if you're cash strapped and you've retired early from the workforce, at some point a higher cost of living will probably mean that you may be compelled or feel compelled to start working again. So you'd expect to see that to start to head up from the current 62.1% that it's currently at, at the moment. So, um, got non-farm payrolls, that's due out on Friday, the 2nd of September. We've also got US consumer confidence on the 30th of August. Now, that is likely to be another disappointment, and it doesn't really tell us anything when it comes to the overall picture as far as the US consumer is concerned, because retail sales have been fairly positive um, for pretty much all of this year, bar for one month in May, where we saw a minor contraction. As far as the dollar is concerned, we've, still, we've taken a little bit of a pause, but we still remain very much in the uptrend that we've been over the course of the past few weeks and months. And ultimately, that's probably going to put further downward pressure on the euro, um, as well as potentially the pound. Let's look at the euro at the moment, because as we can see from this chart here, it looks fairly similar to the DAX, actually. Um, but um, we found a bit of a base at 99, but we are currently str currently struggling to move back above um, parity. Um, we could well move, squeeze all the way back to the 50-day moving average. But ultimately, while we remain in this downtrend, the longer term target for euro dollar remains um, for a move towards 96.20 while in this downtrend that we've been in over the course of the past few days. The trend is your friend. And at the moment, looking to sell euro strength into resistance. Similar sort of thing for the pound. The pound continues to suffer. Um, we've seen the increase in the, in the energy price cap um, today to just over three and a half thousand pounds. Obviously, that's going to be um, a significant headwind going forward. Hopefully, the, well, the government will bring in measures to try and mitigate some of that. But ultimately, I think not only in Europe, but also here in the UK, 
it's going to be a long hard winter with electricity prices in Europe soaring but also here in the UK UK natural gas prices rising to another record high this week above 600 pence per therm so um, the outlook continues to look fairly bleak economically there was a little bit of a rebound earlier this week on the back of a China stimulus plan of $146 billion um, infrastructure um, investment. Um, you know, is that likely to shift the mood when it comes to uh, recovery in the global economy? It's unlikely because while China continues to impose stop start lockdown procedures on its population, they can throw a hell of a lot more money at it and it won't make a difference. Um, it's going to be very, very difficult for the China, Chinese economy to recover until they drop the zero COVID policy, which doesn't look likely in the short to medium term. So any talk of China stimulus packages, if you get a rally in equity markets, it's probably an opportunity to fade it, because ultimately I don't think that no matter what type of stimulus Chinese government implements, it's not going to make any difference if you continue to lock down your population at the drop of a hat or at the drop of a, sing a single infection. It's just not, you know, people aren't people aren't going to take any notice of that. In terms of Brent crude prices, we've seen a bit of a move higher earlier this week on the back of the fact that OPEC suggested that they might cut production. Um, to my mind, if they do that, they'll probably cause the very recession that hopefully they are, they are trying to avoid. But certainly concerns about demand destruction are now more front of mind than they were um, a few weeks ago. So, you know, while we could well see prices move back to $120, $130 a barrel, if they do, that will just exacerbate um, the slowdown in the economy that is coming our way. Winter is coming. And I don't think any amount of mitigation is going to change that. As for equity markets, FTSE 100 continues to remain range bound. Don't see that changing anytime soon. Decent support around about 7,400, resistance to 7,600. Certainly the bias for the short to medium term while we remain below the trend lines that I drew over on the DAX and the S&P still remain very much tilted towards the downside. Similar sort of story for the NASDAQ. Yes, we've broken the downtrend line, but we haven't broken above the 200 day moving average. Consequently, um, that means that any upside break in the NASDAQ, uh, I'm, not entire, I'm not inclined to trust it because I haven't seen confirmation in the DAX or the S&P. Although we are finding support in and around 12,900. Why? Because it was support here. It was resistance here. It's now support in and around these levels sort of here. So keep an eye on that level. But if we get a spike in yields or further pr upward pressure on yields, um, then we could well see this start to roll over. In terms of what else is due out next week, we've got the latest EU flash CPI number for August. We're already at record highs of 8.9% for the July numbers. This month's August number could well see headline CPI move much closer to 10%. Forecasts are currently for a flash CPI number of around about 9% for the EU. I think that's a little bit on the optimistic side. I think it's probably going to be a lot higher than that. Certainly, if, if you look at some of the numbers that have been coming out of mainland Europe, um, Germany could well head up towards 7.8 or 8%, or could head up towards 9% from 8.5%. was reading the wrong column there, um, which would suggest that if we get a sharp jump in German CPI, um, then you could well see a similar sort of jump in the headline number for EU CPI. So that would suggest to me that from 8.9, we could well see a move up to 9.5, um, particularly um, in the context of the moves, high, the moves that we've seen up in energy prices. Also got UK lending data for July. Um, seen a slowdown in mortgage approvals. Over the course of the last few months in June, mortgage approval slips to the lowest levels in two years, coming in at 63,700. Um, we've obviously since then seen a 50 basis point rate hike delivered 
um, in August and the possibility that we've got another one coming in September. So it's likely that we'll probably see another slowdown there. Net consumer credit has been rising, which is a little bit concerning. That jumped sharply to 1.8 billion in June from 0.9 billion in May. So it doubled. Um, the likelihood is that we could well see that rise again as more and more consumers start to borrow to basically pay day-to-day -day bills, utility bills, petrol prices and what have you. We're already seeing that in the US consumer credit for the first six months of this year has absolutely exploded. And the only way to explain that is really to, I think, argue that people are putting an awful lot more on their credit card than was the case six to 12 months ago. So that is a concern uh, going forward. In terms of the earnings numbers, there's not really that much to talk about. Um, we've got Broadcom's third quarter numbers. Earlier this year, they agreed a deal to pay $61 billion for cloud care company VMware as a part of its strategy to reduce its reliance on the surge in semiconductor revenues, which according to Broadcom CEO Hock Ten won't last as capacity gets added to the market. We're certainly seeing have some evidence of that with NVIDIA's numbers earlier this week where they downgraded their Q3 guidance. Um, we've also got numbers from HP. And we know we already know that we're, we're seeing a little bit of a slowdown in um, the PC PC business. Um, a lot of lot more people, a lot of lot more people are buying are not buying as many um, desktop or laptop products. We're already seeing a slowdown in gaming consoles as well. And Microsoft has already said that it's starting to see a slowdown in PC sales as well. So um, those, those are the sort of the two that I would pay particular attention to, as well as Best Buy on the 30th of August, US electronics retailer. Um, Walmart and Target were saying that um, they were seeing a slowdown in spending on uh, high margin items. So obviously electricals are probably higher margin than food and groceries and what have you. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not Best Buy um, signal that they're seeing a little bit of a slowdown in discretionary consumer spending on that particular score. So um, that's pretty much it for this week, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you all have an enjoyable bank holiday weekend. Otherwise, please join me next week for non-farm payrolls webinar, which starts at one o'clock on Friday the 2nd of September. In the meantime, have a great weekend and speak to you all next week.